Ketan, I extend a very good evening and warm welcome to all present on this virtual platform. As we are waiting for Dr. Tharoor to arrive, I thought it would be right to have our other guest, Dr. Ashok Pandey, speaking to all of us and telling us something about the Council of Global Citizenship Education, of which he is the chairperson. Dr. Pandey, warm welcome and over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mota. Thank you, Meenakshi ji, uh, Dr. Sandhya. Uh, lovely kids on the screen, uh, family of Bilda with their Niketan, all those who have connected themselves on the Facebook page of uh, your school. I think uh, today is a very, very special day. Uh, United Nations, uh, Dr. Tharoor, who has served in the United Nations for almost three decades, uh, will be joining us. And, uh, uh, and he will have a lot of insight. But today, uh, I was going through his tenure in the United Nations. I think, uh, Meenakshi, uh, there, is some, uh, yes. there is some noise coming from somewhere. And we'll have to... Yes, uh, even yeah. I can hear. So, uh, okay. Uh, so, I was going through uh, what all he has done. Because he's the chief guest and uh, all of us are very curious to listen to him. I just want to show you this thick book, if you can see. Uh, this is the history of United Nations for the past 70 years. And okay. this book, Dr. Shashi Tharoor has written a chapter looking back. And he okay. has given his entire uh, story of his uh, career from 1978 onwards, when he joined UNSCR, and then he went to the peace building, and then he came to... A, very senior position before he came back to India. Uh, and he said uh, at one place that United Nations is not just about bureaucratization of our conscience. It is about making a real difference in the real people, which only United Nations can. I think it is a very, very profound statement. Yes. And I was so touched by this statement that I tweeted it today. Uh, quoting uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. So, you know, this is the background. In 1948, the United Nations was formed. And as young kids, you should know that India made a tremendous contribution to that formation. And I want to share with you one um, little story, uh, which uh, you should be very proud of. You know, when the uh, United Nations was uh, deliberating the Charter of Human Rights, uh, in that, there was a sentence that all men are born equal. Now, imagine there was one Indian delegate and she was uh, a lady. Uh, she was Dr. Hansa Mehta and she objected to it in 1948. And she said, why it is all men are born equal? How about women? Does it include women or not? And the entire uh, uh, delegation and the whole body took note of it. And the first amendment to the Charter of Human Rights came after that. And therefore, if you read in that charter, the word is that all people, not men or women or anything, you know, so that includes all. So imagine this is the journey. And then, of course, we were in the forefront. We are the key members. Uh, body. Uh, we are chief interlocutor. Our contribution in the United Nations at all the multilateral agencies, whether it is UNESCO, uh, UNICEF, uh, Food Program, International Labor Organization, UNHCR. But on top of it, the UN peacekeeping forces. You know, I mean, hundreds of our men and women have sacrificed. But I can tell you, if you don't know it already, uh, that the Indian peacekeepers are loved and respected and adored all over the world. There were many conflict zones in the world where the two warring parties in the same country, they said that we will bring in truce only when the Indian peacekeeping forces come here and nobody else. Imagine that is the reputation that we have. And therefore, coming back to the United Nations, 
uh, the journey began. And in 2015, I will cut short this journey. Uh, the United Nations uh, program, uh, it is a spokesperson for everybody in the world, 7.5 billion people. They have to look after peace, justice. Everybody has food. Uh, there is no conflict. You know, there is good education. Everybody has opportunities to excel. You know, that is precisely what the United Nations mandate is. And in 2015, they came out with a beautiful articulation of what the future should look like. And they decided that the future should look like where nobody is hungry, nobody is poor, nobody is denied education, nobody is denied energy, nobody is denied water and sanitation, nobody is denied job, nobody is uh, you know, less or more than anybody else. Okay, and then the climate, then partnership within the countries and peace and justice. These are uh, those things. But the goal number four, particularly, quality education and lifelong learning for all, in my opinion, as an educator, is the fulcrum of all that. And all these 17 goals rest on that. Because if there is no education, I think the rest of the things will fall flat. So within that goal number four, there are 17 goals, as I said, and these goals have 169 targets to achieve. And each target has an indicator. So say, for example, goal number four has got seven targets, and then it has got 13 other indicators. So if you achieve those indicators, you will achieve the target, and then you will achieve the goal. And, and 15 years time period was given. It is just like your schooling. You come in nursery and then you graduate after 14 years. Uh, the, the SDGs also have that life cycle. Okay. So within the goal number four, as uh, Meenakshi ji said, one of the goals says to foster global citizenship among the children of the world and thereby in all the citizens. And that is where this global citizenship comes. And what is the global citizenship? Global citizenship does not mean that you forego your identity and you assume new identity. I'll try and explain it to you with a very beautiful example. Once Mahatma Gandhi was asked to represent at a world meet as a Hindu leader. And Mahatma Gandhi said, please don't punish me by inviting me to that deliberation as a Hindu leader. And then people said, what is the problem? Can you explain it? And then he explained it that I'm born in Gujarat. So I'm a Gujarati. My one identity is Gujarati. I'm born in a particular caste. So my, that is one thing. I'm a Hindu. As you are saying, it is fine. I'm an Indian, but at the same time, I'm a world citizen. I'm the citizen of this cosmos and the citizen of this world. That is how he explained uh, in his time what we call today the global citizenship. Now, global citizenship means that you are sensitive to the needs of the people anywhere in the world. Now, you are young children, and I'm just giving you another example which will relate very nicely. You have a very minor fickle tickle in your throat. And suddenly you find that that has turned into cough. And then you find that your muscles are aching. And then you check and thermometer reads 101 degree temperature. And then your appetite is lost and you are feeling sick. Now, what has happened in this thought experiment? A small tickle in your throat has crippled your whole ecosystem of your body. Now, same is true with the humanity. If in any part of the world, even with a small population, if something goes wrong, the entire human race's entropy is disturbed. That is the true meaning and value of global citizenship. And the best thing is that in 2020, all the children of the world and children like you, who are great communicators, who are born in the era of technology, technology comes very naturally to you. 
I use the word that you are the native technologists. People like me are uh, migrants to it. In fact, some of us are refugees to technology, right? And they have just given shelter to people like us. But you are native. You can communicate. You can articulate. You can express. You can come together. You are fearless. You know, you can raise your voice. You don't like injustice. And therefore, you are in the best situation to create a community of world citizens where you are able to look at the problems afresh from a different perspective. And therefore, you will come out with those solutions. So that is the essence of global citizenship within the formation of quality education and lifelong learning for all. And, and that is the answer uh, to your question, uh, Meenakshi ji. And therefore, yes. my uh, suggestion to all of you uh, is that uh, uh, you have to take uh, two or three pledges uh, in your life. Pledge number one is that uh, you are privileged, you know, and these privileges are not available to millions of children across the world, right? And therefore, use this privilege to equip yourself, to make yourself very strong intellectually, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Once you have done that, learn new ideas, thoughts, and skills. That is the first pledge you take. Once you have done it, immediately go to the second one that you will help those who are weak, those who are marginalized, those who are vulnerable. That is the second thing. The third thing in this um, world today, in the 2020, the problem is that everybody has doubt about everything else. Okay? Even you will find a large cross-section of the educated intelligentsia, as we call it, they will tell you that the climate change is a hoax. There is nothing called climate change. You will have to educate people like that. Fake news, okay? The bombardment of the fake news. Imagine yesterday one of the legends was declared dead and we were all mourning and suddenly we got the news. No, 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 he's hale and hearty. And he's doing his thumbs up from his hospital bed. Imagine where we have reached. So this clearing of the doubt and educating the doubtful is your third uh, pledge that you have to take. And the fourth one that you have to do is uh, that uh, you have to find solutions. Okay, uh, Your talent, your technology, everything that you have done, if it is not targeted at finding a solution to at least one problem that the world is facing, then the entire thing, the rest of the three things that I have said before will fall flat. So find a solution. And the last one is, once you have found the solution in the laboratory or in your room, I think you have to commit to take it to the level of action and implementation. So these are the five suggestions that I have for the young and bright people like you. And if something like this can be done, it can be propagated, it can be advocated, and you can become a social uh, activist, not to the extent that you, you make other people's life hell. But within the whole thing, I think if you can do it, you will be a first rate global citizen. And I Thank you so much, uh, really, Dr. Pandey. Uh, Our... Handsome, impressive Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Yes. Uh, welcome, <laughs> sir. I was just filling the gap for you. Now I'm handing it over to Principal Meenakshi Kushwaha. Thank you, Mr. Uh, My apologies to all of you. I had some serious uh, uh, power problems as well as computer problems all in one afternoon. Of just delighted to be with you. Uh, good, you evening, Dr. Uh, good evening, Dr. Tharoor. And a warm welcome to Birla Vidya Niketan, though through this virtual platform. And uh, I would like to, uh, to introduce our chairperson, Mrs. Jayashree Mota, with you. And uh, ma'am, Dr. Tharoor is here. Hello, Dr. Tharoor. Namaskar, so nice how are you? How are you, Jashi ji? I'm very well. And uh, I heard you on the LHP program also about Tharoor Odysseus. <laughs> and it was just delightful, you know. And I have got that book. It's with me most of the time. And I dip into it a number of times a day. Because to a certain extent, I... I I also have the passion for words. And Wonderful. I look after, after a number of schools. So every week for each class from 5 to 12, I send one word. And they have to 
for a week they have to mull over it so yes. and and your book is really very very uh, enjoyable and it should last you for a year mrs mota <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh, yes um so on on yes ma'am so yes. on behalf of birla vidyaniketan dr tharur i extend a very warm welcome to you and uh, dr ashok pande is here so he rightly says he tried to fill in uh, and uh, the gap and keep us busy um, during that time and as we assemble here to celebrate the 75 years of united nations um, we are more than privileged to have you here amongst us uh, because uh, you've been with un for so many years and you rose up to the level of under secretary general and uh, i think we'll gain the most out of it and i now invite students to take this great moment forward thank you principal kufa floor is yours kids good evening sir my name is arman mathur and i study in class 12 i will be moderating Uh, this webinar for today, and uh, Hello, let everyone. me assure the audience, uh, we are in for an amazing time today, because we have with us two multifaceted, holistic personalities. Where on one hand we have the gentleman who I'll describe as super cali fragilistic, expialidocious, also <laughs> through the invariant of that word. Uh, yes, I'm talking about the gentleman with the incredulous vocabulary and the clipped British accent, the former Under Secretary General of the UN, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. We warmly welcome you, sir. Thank you. And sir, I'm majorly fan of this point of time. So forgive me if that becomes a bit too <laughs> evident as we proceed through this webinar. We also have with us uh, eminent educationist Dr. Ashok Pandey, who believes in quality education premised on the virtues of character and sustainable development. He is also the UN ambassador for the hashtag Teach SDGs and hashtag Act for SDGs campaign. And coincidentally, he received the National Teachers Award in 2012 when Dr. Tharoor was the Union Minister of State to the MHRD. So oh, that's a link oh, between. Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Delighted you. to reunite in this way. Reunite on the United Nations Day. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Arman. Yeah. Now, now, in the interest of time, uh, let me begin with you, Dr. Tharoor, and allow me to provide an anchor to our conversation in the UN. Uh -huh. You've often said on multiple fora that uh, the UN is a mirror to the world. It reflects our convergences, our divergences, and our differences, and our hopes and our aspirations. Now, when we envisage a world for the future through the prism of the present, especially with COVID plaguing the world, um, we see a Pandora's box open in front of us. You know, we look to the West and we see uh, US pulling out of the WHO, which seems to be the symptom of this new. Uh, atavistic tribalist isolationist proclivity whereby nations are portraying that you know my my sovereignty and my nationalist stance is above multilateral cooperation and this is manifested in import substitution and protectionism and this whole conversation around deglobalization so what if the first casualty of this post covid world is multilateralism itself thereby becoming an aberration to this beautiful 75 year old experiment and as an inevitable corollary sir i have to ask you as a former diplomat to the un what do you suggest that the international community and the un uh, do to combat or to mitigate this threat over to you sir well i mean it's 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 un unfortunately difficult for the un as an amorphous collective entity to solve the problem because it's actually the will of member states that creates multilateral engagement as i've often reminded people the un is both a stage and an actor it's a stage on which the member states come and play their parts and they negotiate their interests and then it's only after the member states have decided granted the political will and the resources required that the un as an actor as the secretary general or the un agencies can go out and do their work it's very difficult to do something as the un when you have not been authorized by the member states working as the un to do it that is the central dilemma uh, of our of our global system now when member states were prepared to actually act with a larger regard for the interests of humanity um when they were prepared to sacrifice a little bit of their own selfish national interests in the interests of our collective well-being then the un works very well 
when the member states disagree, the UN is often paralyzed or ineffective. That is essentially the key problem we have. And if you were to look, for example, at the present crisis, the pandemic was the perfect moment for the world to come together, to collectively understand the virus, understand how to tackle it, share best practices, pool resources and efforts, and defeat the virus. What happened instead? Every nation for itself, massive panic buying of supplies at the very beginning. Um, uh, even today, there are countries that are trying to uh, put a stranglehold on vaccine supplies for their own nationals first. National sovereignty is being reasserted. On top of that, the disruption of supply lines by the initial lockdowns meant that countries started talking much more about pulling production lines and manufacturing lines and supply lines back to their own countries or closer to their own countries. Even in India, we heard the Prime Minister speaking of Atma Nirbharta. In this mounting insularity and emphasis on national sovereignty, when you have an American president saying America first and Indian Prime Minister saying Indian, India first and so on, then the elusive goal of multilateral cooperation is certainly imperiled. And in those circumstances, it is up to the member states to realize for themselves how important this is for them. I think when the coronavirus pandemic is, is over, as one day it will be, uh, the world needs to have a collective will to get together, analyze what happened, learn lessons from it, and, and take collective measures to forestall the recurrence of the next pandemic. How is that going to happen in the absence of viable international institutions? So when you say, what can the UN do to, re to fight for multilateralism? The UN can articulate such concerns to member states but the political will has to come from member states themselves. They have to decide they want the UN. They created the UN, they have the capacity to destroy the UN too. Thank you for that, sir. And uh, you know, when we told our students that we're going to be interacting with the Dr. Shashi Tharoor, um, almost all of them wanted to interact with you, but uh, due to the paucity of time, we have only four of us, uh, including myself. And uh, sir, plucking out a point from your answer, You've, you've talked about the, you've given a very beautiful metaphor that the UN is both a stage and an actor. And it is actually the member states who are the key players uh, who will sort of uh, anchor the UN in the direction in which it should go. And uh, you've pointed out that far from bolstering multilateralism, COVID-19 has seen this world of nation states logged, in, logged into this destructive con contest, which isn't really going to have any uh, result. And on that, sir, there is this, there's a lot of talk about the Eurocentricity of the UN when we talk about the membership and when we talk about the member states. And regarding that, sir, we have a question from uh, a very good friend of mine who studies in class 12. Her name is Nadia. May I please ask her to unmute herself? Good evening, Dr. Thiru. It is an honor to speak with you. Hi, uh, Nadia. Hello. So what I'd like to ask you is that recent reports indicate a rising transnational threat posed by violent extremism, which is associated with far right or white nationalist sentiments, and is often fueled through domestic politics. Now, uh, in your view, does this Eurocentricity of the United Nations perpetuate this culture? Oh, I think that's a bit unfair. No, I think you can blame the UN for a lot of things, but not for that, Nadia. Uh, the, the UN is not that Eurocentric an organization. Yes, it's located in the West, its work ethic and habits of organization and structure and performance are probably Western and Western yardsticks are usually applied, but uh, the organization is very conscious of the need to um, look beyond any one region. And indeed, um, uh, as somebody myself, who's been privileged to have had a very uh, strong career there, working with people of every country on earth, I never felt for one second that um, my nationality or my color was in any way a factor in the way I was judged. People at the UN, and I speak for the UN Secretariat and the agencies, are judged entirely on their ability to perform and to deliver results. And, um, and therefore, I would consider the UN uh, arguably the world's least racist organization. It is nationality conscious for political reasons. It is certainly not at all hospitable ground for things like white racists and, 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 and people who are anti the Black Lives Matter movement and people who are in any way in favor of vigilante violence against minority groups who are xenophobes. 
The UN can simply never be accused of that from my own experience. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm convinced that um, uh, every person I know at the UN um, wouldn't be working there if they had a slightest racist bone in their body. That was very well put, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, sir. And while we're still on the topic of membership of the UN, and while we've got done with talking about the, the uh, questions on its Eurocentricity, now there is another question which is uh, um, asked a lot when we talk about this existential crisis which the UN is facing. And that question is about the veto power, about the, the veto power of the permanent members. And regarding that, sir, we have a question from uh, Gul Mathur of Class 12, another uh -huh. student of ours. Right. Good evening, sir. I'm Gul Mathur. I'm from Hi, Class Gul. 12. Right. Um, sir, the veto, hello, sir. The veto mechanism in the UN has been a topic of heated debate. And now with a completely different political reality, with more nuclear weapon states than 1945, and a distinct economic world map, uh, the veto mechanism, I personally think, empowers important nations like um, that of Mr. Jair Bolsonaro's Brazil to pull out of international obligations. Now, with this in mind, do you think there's a need to alter this mechanism or to at least expand its uh, recipients? Well, as you can probably imagine, Gul, there are a lot of people that agree with you, particularly from those countries that don't have the veto. Um, but you have to understand the historical reasons why the veto was allowed or was created in the first place. You see, between the First and the Second World Wars, there was a similar but less successful global body called the League of Nations. In the League of Nations, however, nobody had a veto. Every decision had to be taken unanimously. And when um, countries vehemently disagreed, they essentially got expelled. Uh, the US never joined. Russia was expelled after its invasion of Finland. Italy was expelled after its invasion of Abyssinia, what we know as Ethiopia, and so on. So that the problem became that the League, uh, by its ways of working, essentially condemned itself to irrelevance because the big powers of the day, oh, and Germany was expelled because of Sudetenland when it marched into Czechoslovakia. So the result is the big powers of the day did not belong to it except for Britain and France. All the other big powers, which were Germany, Russia, Italy, and the US, uh, did not belong or were expelled, and therefore the League essentially was irrelevant. So the Second World War happened, more horrors, the horrors of the Holocaust and Hiroshima and so on. And as the world reeled from those devastating first 45 years of the century, and they said, we have to do something to ensure that the world is in fact um, not going to be such a disastrous place in the second half of the century. Uh, they said, what can we do to design a better international organization that may not collapse or will not collapse as the League of Nations did in merely 20 years. Um, and the answer, they said, is we need a world organization that the big powers of the day will join and will have an incentive not to leave. Now, how do you get an incentive not to leave it? You ensure that the organization can never do anything against their vital interests. How do you ensure that? By giving them a veto in the most powerful body in the organization, in this case, the Security Council, which deals with all issues of peace and security. Which means that if you have a veto, you know your fundamental interests are secure. No one can invade you. No one can sanction you. No one can take any decisions that affect you fundamentally. And you, in turn, can veto decisions that affect the interests of your, um, of your close allies and dependent states and so on. And as a result, you will never be tempted to leave because you're secure there. In fact, the Soviet Union realized the wisdom of this when they foolishly boycotted the Security Council uh, and uh, in their absence from the Security Council, the UN decided to invade Korea and, and support the South Koreans in the civil war against the North Koreans. And the Russians came scuttling back, but by then it was too late and they realized we should never again be absent. We need to stay here uh, in order to protect our interests. Now, that is the logic of the veto. And in those days, the questions that the founding members asked is, which are the countries we can't do without? In those, they said, if tomorrow India leaves or Brazil leaves or Nigeria, Nigeria wasn't even there, uh, it was still a colony, it doesn't matter. But if Britain leaves, because there was the world's biggest empire at that time, if the Soviet Union leaves, if America leaves, then our organization is doomed to irrelevance. Now, you're right in saying that that reflects the geopolitical realities of 1945 and not today. So the question is, why do these countries have the veto today 
and not Germany or Japan, which are the third and second largest donors to the UN? Why doesn't India, which is the world's largest democracy and will soon we have the largest population in the world, uh, why doesn't no African country have a veto? Why does no Latin American country have a veto? Well, the answer is that to, in order to change that situation, you need a consensus uh, of two thirds of the member states of the organization. And that hasn't been forthcoming on any formula. So we are carrying on. Uh, I, I think, in fact, even if a new category of permanent members is created to accommodate the interests of countries like India, Germany, and Japan, I am far from sure they'll ever be given the veto because many countries think the veto is a bad idea and uh, it should not be given to any more countries. Others say, well, why don't we dilute the danger of the veto by saying, yeah, okay, we'll give you all the veto, but now in future, one veto alone will not stop the UN acting. You need two countries to veto something for it to act. All these are brilliant ideas, but how are you going to get them into an amendment of the Charter without the consent of the very countries whose powers you're intending to dilute? I don't think it's going to happen. So I think we just have to live with that structure for now. But Security Council reform to make it a more representative body uh, will be absolutely essential if the body is to be seen as legitimate around the world. And it worries me that the more they delay and defer uh, Security Council reform, the more they risk a perception of the continued irrelevance of the UN. Thank you, thank you sir. For, th thank you for that, sir. And uh, thank you for pointing out that when we think of uh, veto, when we think of the, this veto power which has been given and we and a lot of member countries, and especially as a students, we think of it as unfair when we first read about the UN. But uh, a more pragmatic, closer look at the veto power tells us that it was brought in as an incentive and uh, we still need it as an incentive because the, because many of the superpowers might not even agree to cooperate if the veto is taken away from them. And that's why you've uh, sort of uh, focused and emphasized on, uh, un on the Security Council reforms to make it more representative. And I think that's a, a very, very salient point which we really need to realize. And now, so moving on from the membership aspect of it to the broader contours of uh, global geopolitics. Now, uh, French President uh, Emmanuel Macron gave this beautiful speech uh, right uh, in, in the end of September uh, to the United Nations General Assembly. And he had pointed out that uh, the UN had risked its uh, powerlessness and the UN Security Council, which was supposed to guarantee peace and security, were clashing on, like, two of the main powers were clashing on, among themselves because of this, uh, again, this proclivity, which I pointed out at the beginning, this need for hegemony. And this, this was basically a reference to the Sino- uh, American tensions and talking about China's rise as an emerging global power. Uh, a friend of mine, his name is Adnan and he studies in class 11. He has a question in that aspect. Good evening, sir. So first of all, I would like you to know that currently I'm in the process of going through and reading through your book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, and also on the quest of, you know, when can I use my new and enhanced vocabulary, whether it's Nolgoster <laughs> or Defenestrate? So coming to the question, sir, back in 2016, you talked about that the world is moving towards a post-superpower epoch with Martin Jacques. And also considering the China's paradox and apart from building up a rally of resistance, what according to you, sir, should be the building blocks India should look at right now, considering its personal growth? What an interesting Thanks, question. Sir. First of all, uh, you, 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 I thought you were going to say that my prediction of 2016 seems to have uh, not worn very well, uh, because clearly instead of uh, a post-superpower world, we're looking at a second superpower on the rise in terms of China. And yet I would argue that the more uh, significant powers that rise, the greater the prospects of us not thinking in those binary terms that your parents' generation will remember from the Cold War. Uh, and that's really the, I think, the defense that I could give you for my statement of 2016. But when you say, what should India do? I mean, I could give you a very long and complex answer, and many of my books have addressed all of this, but the simplest answer to my mind is we have to get our act together first at home. If you want to be taken seriously in global geopolitics, you can't be a country that is riven with social dissension or lack of, uh, lack of coherence and lack of, uh, of, of harmony at home, 
Uh, you can't have communal violence and minority baiting and all of that nonsense that's going on. You must have economic prosperity uh, because obviously uh, if people in your country are going to bed hungry or going to sleep on the floor hungry, then you have failed them. You need to absolutely work on uh, both the hardware of development, that is the ports, the roads, the airports, the railways, and so on, and the software of de development, education, health, sanitation, basic human capital. And if you get, get all of those things right, and then start prospering and growing, you won't even need to actually assert yourselves or seek uh, a permanent seat in the Security Council. Countries will come to you saying, we can't imagine doing without you. The way in which today they would come to China uh, because China has got those things right. You see, uh, we used to have only one aspect of that right. We were a country that was an extraordinarily, in fact, an astonishingly successful example to the world of the management of social, religious, linguistic, and ethnic diversity within the framework of a thriving democracy. We were relatively less successful economically till um, uh, about the 90s, and then we picked up until about... Uh, the beginning of this decade, we were a success story economically. And at that point, that was our, those, were, those were our peak years when we were the world's fastest growing free market democracy, thriving, energetic people with a sense of vision for the future. And unfortunately for us, we kind of lost that uh, in recent years and we need to pick it up. So if we can get that right, if we are a prosperous, thriving economy, if we have an excellent uh, level of social harmony and cooperation amongst our people. And we've got the hardware and software of development right, so that people have the basics, uh, three square meals a day, uh, decent education for their children, prospect of a better life for the next generation, these things. Then I can assure you that you have every geopolitical option you want, but you cannot go around talking about being a superpower when you're still super poor. Thank you so much for that, sir. That was a very, very, very comprehensive answer, and I think it speaks for itself. Uh, I just want to thank you, sir, on behalf of all the students of PVN for taking out the time to interact with us, because this is really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us, especially for me. Because... Arman, since I'm late, and I know you have at least one more question that you couldn't ask, I'll let you ask it. Will you go ahead then, and, and you can ask one more question to make up for my being late in the beginning. Absolutely, sir. Okay. So I personally had a question, uh, which I wanted to ask. And uh, I saw your recent interview with you. Uh, and and in, in that interview, you've talked about the UN. And you used a very interesting Ghanaian proverb, which you said, Mr. Kofi Annan had said to you, that you don't hit someone on the head when you have your hand between their teeth. And that you had said with reference to, um, you know, why the security general, the, the, uh, under, the secretary generals of the UN are, are not being bold. That was the accusation, which was, put forward to you. And I really wanted to ask that I understand and I absolutely understand that analogy as well as the explanation for it. But what I don't seem to understand is that um, if the, secure, the, the, uh, the uh, Secretary General cannot be bold, uh, despite the fact that he is um, the leader of an organization as holistic and as huge as the UN, the biggest international organization in the world, then uh, how will we go forward? Because the UN agreed is a creature of its members, but uh, it needs to have some uh, tangible jurisdiction where it can act and where it can bring about concrete, tangible change. Yes, but you know, the thing is, <laughs> it again goes back to the very first question you asked, Arman. It's about the fact that the UN is owned by the member states. The Secretary General is still, in the last analysis, an employee of the member states. Um, uh, one of the things I suggested was that the Secretary General and other heads of UN agencies should be given a single non-renewable term of six or seven years, rather than being vulnerable to governmental pressure because of their own desire for re-election. And that's something which um, no one is particularly keen on taking me up on, but I suggested that some time ago. Um, and I would argue that uh, it would actually enable a Secretary General uh, to be a little more independent um, so that then they're, they're not worried about or hoping for a second innings uh, at, the, at the grace and favor of the countries that they need to stand up to. But even then it may not change. And I'll tell you why, Arman. Let's say that um, the Secretary General believes he can fight the US or fight China on 
a particular issue because it's of such transcendent importance for the world. At the very same time, he has 10 other issues that he needs their cooperation on to get done. So, and they're all issues of great importance for the world. So when you're dealing with a major civil war in one country, you're also dealing with a pandemic, you're also dealing with an AIDS crisis, you've got a refugee problem, you've got various uh, human rights declarations that are being formulated, a treaty is being negotiated and something else. How do you say that any one of these issues are so important that you will risk your effectiveness on 10 other issues by antagonizing a member state that can thwart you on all of them? So in common sense terms, no secretary general is ever going to be grandstanding against a powerful member state uh, because the secretary general knows that on any given occasion, he has so many issues to deal with. And on those issues, he always needs uh, the powerful member states to cooperate with him for him to achieve what he wants to achieve. That's a uh, sort of welcome to the real world of diplomacy and why diplomats are always conciliators. It's always easy to tell somebody to buzz off once, but you can't tell them to buzz off if at the same time there are a dozen other issues in which you want them to stay with. That's the real problem. Okay, well, good luck to all the students of the Birla, Birla Vidya Niketan. Arman, you're an outstanding moderator, very impressed. I hope that you will go on to um, be a very uh, effective public speaker. You already are, but I mean in, in future life as well. Thank you to all the bright students for their excellent questions and to Principal Kushwaha and Mrs. Mota for having invited me to celebrate the United Nations Day with all of you. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Dr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank yes, sir. So and delightful. Dr. Tharoor, yes. And Dr. Tharoor, your quotation, India matters to me and I would like to matter to India. It's such a powerful quotation and extremely meaningful, you know. And I feel that... Um, it matters to us as a school community and to inspire something out of it that how much can we and should we matter to the nation more than the nation mattering to us. So thank you so much, Dr. Tharoor. And I'm glad you were late because uh, we got 30 minutes of yours instead of 20 that you had promised. Thank you so much. I have a five o'clock engagement, so I knew I had a little more. Thank right. you so much. All thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tharoor. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Nice, nice thanks to for, see you thanks for uh, filling in the breach. Much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. It, it was a privilege. Um, yes. Uh, so now, Dr. Pandey, uh, we have questions for you also and I, would request you to um, uh, give answers if you don't have any other appointment after, I the, have, after that. I have the appointment, but I don't want to disappoint some of them. And therefore, my uh, request is if the questions can be asked straight away. Okay. And if I have the answer, I'll give you maybe next 10 minutes. Uh, All uh, then right, I'll... done. Okay. Done. So 10 uh, more I'm minutes, not right? depriving anybody of anything. Uh, just because in the interest of time, we will have to uh, uh, make this concession for me. Uh -huh. So 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, sir. Let's just uh, rush rush to the questions then. Uh, first up, sir, we have a question from uh, Ishatkar from class 11. Good evening, sir. I'm a commerce student and I would like to ask that the development goals are too ambitious, but aren't they way too costly as estimates vary from $3.5 trillion to $5 trillion a year. The global budget is $135 billion a year. Isn't this way too much for spending on SDGs while still we are facing many challenges? What's your view on this, sir? Okay, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you know, what you have asked is very interesting. Uh, what you are suggesting is that we have to spend a lot of money on too little thing to achieve. I think that perception is not correct. You see, if we don't spend on those, nobody will survive to spend this lot of money on anything else. Uh, let us put it that way. After all, if we have money or if we have to generate money, it should be spent on what? It should be spent on 7.5 billion people. How can we sleep ourselves when somebody is not sleeping because they and their children did not have a meal that evening, right? I mean, that is something that we have to think about. How can we live with the global average temperature shooting up? You know, how can we live with so much of inequality, injustice, child trafficking, you know, conflict, 
do you think uh, we'll have to pay a lot more price when it hits us than we have to pay now and therefore this perception has to change this is number one number two one person one body one nation does not have to spend this entire amount of money right and it doesn't have to be spent tonight you know it is it is a longitudinal investment it is all across the world investment and it is for today it is for tomorrow and it is for the posterity so if you do these breakdowns with your knowledge of commerce and accountancy i'm sure you will be convinced it is every single penny being spent for its worth thank you sir thank you yeah. for that sir and in your first conversation with uh, uh, mota ma'am you talked about the national education policy and you've talked about how you're very optimistic about it and you feel that with certain um, caveats in implementation it can do very very well now regarding that sir we have the we have a question from sneha of class 11 okay sneha good evening sir good my evening. question my question to you is how do you view the enactment of the new education policy in reference to the post sustainable development goals surrounding equality in access to educational opportunities yes absolutely uh, you see a person like me is so happy you know um uh, uh, jashri ma'am asked this question is it uh, in the framework of internationalism i think uh, i will complete that answer which serves the purpose now also you know in the very preamble of the national education policy it talks about three or four things and that about you know sums up the entire philosophy of it the first thing is it talks about india's knowledge system and india's philosophy of education and well being of all this is the first thing it talks about the second thing it talks about is the obligation of every country you know to mainstream itself into the world body so one of them is united nations that we are talking about the third obligation is that uh, you know the 75 years after independence you know now we are in 2020 and the aspirations have changed you know can we live today with what we lived day before yesterday no it is not possible you know you are you are different from your predecessors 10 years ago you are much more different from your parents from your grandparents you know people like me and mrs koshwaha we have seen children for decades and we know how the generations are changing in their aspirations in their understanding and in their abilities right so this is the 21st century reality that this is the this is the third thing and fourth thing of course is india is a vast country you know today 300 million children like you go to a school and 200 million children like you have dropped out of the school just because they could not continue it for many reasons you see and there are another 200 million children between the age of 3 to 6 who do not have any access to education and the governments have never thought of their education so in this education policy we are going to bring those 200 million before age 6 we are going to bring back those 200 million who have dropped out and we are going to ensure a quality education for the 300 million who are coming to schools so so these are the four obligations which define the entire tenet of new education policy Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank Sneha. You. Yeah. Uh, thank you so thank much for that, sir. And uh, one an, another thing which you said when you were giving uh, that introduction was that uh, the fourth SDG regarding equality and uh, equality education and the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities that you call the fulcrum of uh, yeah. uh, of all the seventeen SDGs. And regarding that, regarding the fourth SDG, we have another question from uh, Vidangi of Class Eleven. Okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Vidangi. Good evening. The the fourth sustainable development goal ensures exclusive and equitable quality education and promotes lifelong learning opportunities for all. However, currently a lot of students have been facing problems in coping up with online education. So, do you think we need to bring about the change in aim at fulfilling this goal now? yeah of course uh, you know what has happened is i'll tell you a bit of a uh, statistics 
when we started this journey of sustainable developmental goals in 2015, the aggregate index at which the world stood at that point of time in what we call social progress index, SPI, covering all these was 69 point out of 100, right? Uh, today, we have reached on an aggregate up to around 75, 76. Now, imagine next 10 years, we have to reach to 100. Now, the, the statistics today is by 2030, Denmark is the only country which will achieve 100% SDGs. There is a country called Central African Republic, which will be the last in this race of achieving SDGs. G7 countries like Germany, Japan, Italy, France, you know, they will be behind Canada. US, Canada, they will be even further behind. But the struggle is with the countries like India, China, Philippines, Bangladesh, Indonesia, you know, a whole lot of African countries, they are struggling, right? And that is why that investment question, which came in the beginning, uh, becomes much more important now. Now, this eight months, it is absolutely true, Vedangi, that uh, it has given us a very, very bad hit. And that is why it is necessary that our resolve doubles. Because not only that we have to move at the same pace, if we are going to achieve it in 2030, we have to double the acceleration, you see? So we have to go uh, like you drive your car on a highway, right? Uh, when, when you are not mindful of the speed. So I think speeding reform, speeding investment, and speeding contribution from the governments, from the non-governmental bodies, individual philanthropists, social activists, all of them have to come together with funds and technology to achieve these goals. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And now you've raised a very important point about the trajectory of the implementation of these SDGs. Absolutely. And regarding that too, we have a question from one of our students of class 11, Pratham. Good evening, sir. Yes, Pratham. The trajectory of implementation of the 17 sustainable development goals has been hit up by the current going pandemic. Do you think there is a need for the timeline to be changed or will the world be able to cope up in just nine years? So, uh, I, I gave you some hint to uh, your question's answer, uh, but let me um, just extend that. If everything was going all right, Pratham, then by 2030, the estimates were that the world's aggregate SPI would have reached around 89 to 90, which means uh, we were not going to achieve that. But that assumption was based on the current level of speed and velocity and acceleration, right? But that can be changed if our velocity and acceleration increases, right? But I would certainly in all realistically uh, perception way, I will admit that the speed has been slowed down. But then I would add very, very uh, hassily that that should not deter us. Because the moment we reconcile that, no, we are hit and we are bruised and we are injured, and therefore it is an excuse for us to allow the speed to take over us rather than we taking over the speed, then probably we'll go far, far behind. And therefore, uh, we have to work with the target year 2030 in mind, but our efforts have to increase. I will also give you one more insight into it. You know, out of the 17 goals, there are three categories of goals. Number one category is in which all across the world we are doing very well. And there is a second category in which we are struggling. And there is a third category in which we are, our performance is dismal. So now, despite COVID, if we put in our effort on those third category, and I will tell you what are those, then probably our statistics will go up suddenly. Right? So the third category in which we have not achieved much are unfortunately those categories which refer to goals like 16, let us say, peace and justice, goal like goal number 10, inequality, 
also to some extent gender equality, which is a separate goal altogether. So even if COVID is there and we change our strategy that we put more focus and effort on those goals in which we were struggling in any case pre-COVID, then probably our uh, whole scenario will change, right? And those goals in which we were doing already good, we should not lower our guards on those goals. So a little bit of change in strategy and a lot of resolution, a fresh resolution and determination. And as I said, a collective effort, I think it's still the goal is within our visibility, howsoever hard it may be to achieve. Thank you for that, sir. And last question we have, and it is yet again on this, uh, this framework of the implementation of the SDGs. And uh, this question comes from another class 11 student, sir. His name is Devansh. Yes, Devansh. Good evening, sir. Sir, so my question to you is that, as we all know, um, sustainable development goals must not be in conflict with the country's policy and stance. But what if a nation deliberately backs out of an agreement that is made to fulfill these very goals? Say, for example, the withdrawal of US from the Paris Climate Agreement. So how do you think that the UN will accommodate the absence of such a big player, which is also the biggest historical contributor to climatic change? climate change? Thank you. So I, I think Dr. Tharoor made it uh, abundantly clear that, you know, it is something like, uh, uh, let me give you a very uh, a uh, funny example, you know, today you have this program and uh, the principal has made all the arrangements and at the last moment, Devansh comes and tells, I'll not be able to take part in it. What can Minakshi do about it? Just tell me that, right? Probably she will try and manage it without Devansh. Your question could have been asked by Adnan or somebody else, you see? So I don't think that I'm trivializing it. All that I'm saying is that these problems would come but 193 countries have signed SDGs, you see? And they signed it voluntarily. There was no pressure on them. There was no coercion on them. And nobody was having a gun over their head. So you commit to something and then you withdraw from your commitment. It does not happen often, you see? It, it is only an exceptional situation in which it can happen. And fortunately, I can tell you, uh, President Trump has only threatened but he cannot withdraw out of it until one day after his re-election, right? So we still have some time and we'll play to, pray to Goddess Durga uh, that he mind, his mind changes by that time. You get my point? But let me also tell you, ever since he has come, he has given a lot of statements uh, discouraging to all this. But there is one gentleman whose name is Al Gore. You know, you see this uh, green ring on my blazer. Uh, this is a climate reality ring, you know, which has been given to me by Vice President Al Gore. And uh, he is a climate uh, uh, activist. You must have seen one documentary ma which made him famous, The Inconvenient Truth. And it also earned him the Nobel Prize, right? He said that if President Trump does less, people of America will do more. I think that's about some up. Uh, your answer to, uh, to your question is, if president does less, people will do more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for that, sir. Now, may I just uh, invite upon Principal Ma'am to provide a vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. We had a wonderful session and I'm sure my students uh, got a good insight into the UN and the SDGs today. And uh, I think it was a very enlightening session today. Thank you so much for giving you, us that, those Thank you, uh, 15 Jashri more minutes. Ma Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Thank you it was much. wonderful. Thank you, Sandhya ji and all these students. every bit of it. And I look forward to meeting you very soon, as soon as the, this crisis is over. Privilege would be yes. mine, ma'am. I'm looking yes. forward to that. But yes. I must compliment uh, Jashi, ma'am, and Kushwaha, ma'am. And, and as a parent, Dr. Sandhya also, what a brilliant group of children. I, I yes. knew it very in the smart. beginning only, and yeah. they have revealed it absolutely fantastically. Thank, Thank you so much. We have good teachers also. Absolutely. Yes. It, is, it, is, it, it yes. goes without saying. Yeah. Goes without saying. <laughs>
thank you very much thank you for uh, an enriching session absolutely on behalf of all the parents i would just like to thank principal ma'am our chairperson and dr pandey as well for a wonderful and enriching session on the un absolute delight to hear you sir thank you bye bye thank you very thank much thank you so much thank, thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you thank you bye bye thank you very good minakshi